Welcome to another edition of RCE. Uh, again, I'm your host, Brock Palin, and I have with me once again my wonderful, helpful co-host, Jeff Squires from OpenMPI and Cisco Systems. Uh, that's, a, that's quite an introduction. Thanks, Brock. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Jeff. Uh, we have with us today Sean McKee. Um, he's a research scientist at the University of Michigan and a part of the Atlas Group. Atlas, if I'm understanding correctly, is the detector on the Large Hadron Collider, the big uh, particle accelerator that they've been working on over in CERN in Switzerland. So it should be pretty interesting. Sean, uh, could you give us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I got my PhD originally at the University of Michigan, and I've been involved in high energy physics since the days of the superconducting super collider that some people may have heard of that was a big equivalent experiment to the LHC. It actually was larger in scope, but was canceled by Congress in 1991. Um, I became involved with ATLAS in around 1999, so I've been working on this experiment now for 10 years, and some people have been working on it much longer. Um, ATLAS was actually formed as an official collaboration in uh, 1992, and it's a worldwide collaboration um, doing high energy physics. Um, ATLAS itself is, I believe now, officially not an acronym anymore, but originally it was a, a toroidal LHC apparatus, <laughs> and that's how, with that tortured acronym, they got ATLAS out of it by capitalizing the right letters in that statement. <laughs> so um, there's about 2,000 physicists all over the world, um, PhDs, uh, professors, uh, postdocs, research scientists that are working on ATLAS. And if you actually include all their groups, it's much larger. So there are many more graduate students or even undergraduates working on various aspects of ATLAS. So a primary staff of about 2,000 and a cast of millions. That's right. That's right. And of course, ATLAS is, as um, Brock mentioned, it's one of uh, the experiments at the LHC. The LHC is this large um, proton collider. It's about 27 kilometers around. It's underground um, in near Geneva, Switzerland. Um, it actually goes under Switzerland and France, both. Um, and there are two big colliding experiments, the points where the beams rotate in opposite directions and they collide, either at the ATLAS detector or at our sister experiment called CMS, um, which is sort of our friendly competitor, um, which is important in hydrogen physics, uh, I, I might add, that you have two experiments. Um, because you wouldn't necessarily trust that one very complex experiment like this um, would give a new, interesting, earth-shaking result unless you could get confirmation from another experiment. So we, we tend to want to do these things with at least two. Um, and they have different you know, detector technologies and different groups working on it. So you have some confidence if you see something new and interesting in both, then you've got some uh, validation that what's going on is real new physics. So, uh, the uh, what is the purpose of the actual Atlas experiment and the uh, LHC? Okay, so um, in high energy physics, we've developed over the years something called the standard model of high energy physics, and it's it's been a very successful model. Um, there have been predictions made, for example, out to six decimal places. Experiments have been done and confirmed to six decimal places the predictions. So we have, you know. It's our, it's our theory, but it's a, it's a well-tested, well-developed theory. One of the interesting pieces, though, that's missing is something called the Higgs boson. And that's the only standard model particle that's yet to be observed. We have every belief that it exists, but we don't know for sure because it, it hasn't been observed yet. And the Higgs boson is, is related to a mechanism that actually gives mass to things called W and Z bosons and other particles that would differentiate them from photons, which are also bosons, that are you know, observed in regular electricity and magnetism. You know, and photons, light coming from the sun, you know, wherever, those photons are massless. But these other bosons, these W and Zs, and in fact the other particles in hydrogen physics have mass because of this Higgs mechanism. And the Higgs boson is a, sort of a representative piece of that model. So that's one of the primary purposes. But ATLAS and, in fact, the other experiments at the LHC are exploring a whole host of of different things. There's better understanding of, of pieces of the standard model. There are things related to the asymmetry between matter and antimatter in our universe. Um, in, you know, in the beginning, if there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter, we really shouldn't be here. The matter and antimatter would recombine and annihilate into photons and energy. 
and there wouldn't be anything. So there apparently is a slight asymmetry between matter and antimatter. There's a little bit more matter, like a part in a billion. And that part in a billion is what you see around us. So that's an interesting question, why there's that asymmetry, and if it's, if it's true. Um, and Atlas can help shed some light on that. There are other things like dark matter. There are possible um, various theoretical models about um, high energy physics extensions to the standard model that would give rise to so-called dark matter. If you look out in the, the, the universe as a whole, you can see how fast galaxies are rotating. If you add up all the stars and you figure out how fast the galaxies are rotating, it doesn't hold together. It seems like the galaxies should just spin apart. All the stars should be thrown off, like putting a bunch of you know, marbles on a, on a merry-go-round and spinning it, and they all fly off. Gravity holds them together, so we can calculate roughly how much gravity you need to hold these things together, and you come up with a lot more than what you see in the visible matter. So we hypothesize that there's something called dark matter that holds this all together. And Atlas may have some opportunities to discover, actually measure some dark matter if it exists. There are other things like supersymmetry and technicolor extensions to the standard model that may exist. And one interesting thing that maybe both of you had heard about, there's the possibility we might produce microscopic black holes in Atlas, which is actually not as dangerous as it sounds. <laughs> and it, it would be a very interesting uh, thing to observe. The microscopic black holes would evaporate very quickly in sort of a burst of particles, and they would give us a fairly unique um, signature in the Atlas detector. So that's just some of what we're, we're looking for. But basically, it's understanding the fundamental laws of nature and how things work at a very basic level that we're after. Okay, so that's a, that's a nice overview about what we're looking for in the Atlas detector. The Atlas detector itself is uh, physically quite large. And is, how many collisions per like second do you expect to have when the detector is up and running? So we'll have approximately 40 million um, beam crossings per second. So that means there are, there are the, the, the way the LHC works is we load up bunches of protons traveling each direction. And they're very dense little packets of protons. We try and squeeze them together and make them as dense as possible so that when they collide, they have a high probability of, of you know, really colliding centrally with a lot of energy transfer. Um, so you'll get 40 million beam crossings per second in normal operating mode at the LHC. And since the proton density in each bunch, we try to make it as, as large as we can, sometimes you'll have more than one proton colliding with one other proton in each beam crossing. Um, the net result is we can get about, in, in normal so-called luminosity, that's how, how dense the protons are and how fast they're colliding, we can get about 25 megabytes of data per event multiplied by 40 million beam crossings multiplied by another factor, which is how many events per beam crossing. You can easily exceed a petabyte a second of data coming out of the experiment. So there's, there's absolutely no way <laughs> we can deal with a petabyte a second. We don't know of any way to do that. Um, so what we end up having to do is use a combination of um, hardware and firmware and software to reduce that to something much more reasonable. So we anticipate actually writing to disk about three to four hundred megabytes a second during normal operating mode for Atlas. Um, and the Atlas itself, as you mentioned, is huge. It's 44 meters long. It's 25 meters in diameter, so it's a multi-story building way underground. It's a few hundred meters underground in a large chamber. It weighs about 7,000 tons. Um, Atlas is physically the largest um, experiment at the LHC, but it's not the heaviest. Our sister experiment, CMS, is heavier. They're, they're smaller, denser. Um, so a little bit of a contrast, but it's, it's pretty spectacular to go down and see the detector and get this um, interesting view of, you know, it looks like a a huge city block of, of lots of wires and detectors and uh, fancy science fiction looking stuff. So it's, it's pretty neat to visit. Very cool. We're, we're computer guys here and this, this physics stuff is fascinating, but uh, let me, let me ask you some, some further details about some of the numbers you were throwing out there. You were saying that, you know, you could get a petabyte a second, but you do, you know, a variety of techniques to